Hello and welcome to An Academy, the one-stop solution for an English medium UPSC civil services aspirant. As part of your Hindu analysis today, we'll be discussing seven important articles out of the Hindu newspaper. Now, before we begin, we have two very important announcements. I hope that you are going to be a part of RM 2024, which is happening on our platform itself. Over and above that, you are also giving UCSC, which is happening today. Maybe the 11 a.m. slot is not available for you, but the 5 p.m. slot is still there. So you can still register for that. And the link is given in the description box. And you can give the UCSC the scholarship test at 5 p.m. Thereafter, we have a very important concept or what we call as a scheme which is going on under which we are giving 50% off and six months extension on any form of subscription to our channel itself or to our platform. And thereafter, all, you already know that on April 6th, we have started a new batch with Mukesha teaching geography. And this batch will have all the features as we know from live classes to PTS to MTS to you can everything inbuilt into it. Now with this, let's look at the topics we're going to cover for today. The first one will be about women's employment and the labor force participation rate. A very interesting article that way. Thereafter, we will go into solar power production. Then the H5N1, what we call as basically the bird flu. And then after the concept of compensatory, what we call as afforestation, CAMPA. Then after we have two small topics, one a very important road which the BRO has recently or is going to recently open. And thereafter with elections in India, what is the Chinese angle to it? As you can see, the paper with regards to how they align with the UPSC papers is either GS paper 3. This is relevant for GS paper 1 also with society and women's aspect related to it. Now, with this, let's look at and try to understand these four in a lot of detail. These are mains level topics and the prelims statements we will discuss in what is a perspective with regards to the prelims examination itself. Okay. So, with this, the first article which came in the FAQ section was basically about women's employment, about labor force participation rate and a very interesting discussion with regards to how they get employment. So what we are going to do here is we will try to understand what are the basic contours, we will try to understand the static behind it, what is the basic concept behind it itself. So, so the first question which comes automatically is what is labor force participation rate because it is used all across the whole article itself and thereafter when we will move from this to understand the women's angle here and thereafter we'll also understand the issues what are the obstacles which are there for women's participation in the labor force so the first question which is what is labor force participation rate it is very simply very simply and if you go by the official definition it is labor force divided by the working population Working population age varies according to international standard, it is 15. In India, it is taken 16 to 64. This will give you the percentage of people, part of labor force, part of labor force out of, out of the working population, out of the working population. Basically, if there are 16 to 64 age bracket, how many people, they all are eligible to become the working population. Out of them, how many are part of the labor force? How many are part of the labor force? That is what is labor force participation ratio or rate. Now, this means that we can divide the data into two. Further, we can divide it into male and female. Meaning that out of all the female which fall under 16 to 64, and out of all male which fall under again 16 to 64, how many are part of the labor force? This is basically the premise here. This is basically the premise here that how many of the, of the male and female population, men and women are part of the labor force vis-a-vis -a, -vis a part of the working population. This is the static portion. This is the pure economics part of it. There are terminologies which are used. We are trying to understand that which is the static portion here. Now, what the article points out, what the article points out, I hope this concept is totally clear to you. What the article points out is that when we talk about the data for male and we talk about female, 
the data is very skewed skewed in the sense that 78.5 we can call it 78.5 percent meaning 78.5 percent of all males which fall fall under that 16 to 64 category they are part of the labor force doing some form of work for sure now this number is ex extremely dismal for female out of their 100 percent we have 37 percent of women who are basically part of the labor force this is the labor force participation rate labor force participation rate so you can see there's a major difference close to double the men are working than the the females now this ratio is much lower than the global average that this would be 49 percent as the global average itself so we are below that also 12 percent further further this is only after 2019 first thing we can establish what is the conclusion that is what really matters to us for the examination the first conclusion is that the men outnumber the women when it comes to participation or what we can call as the numbers related to labor force participation numbers related to labor force participation over and above that we can also see that we are below the global average for females so it is not that it is universal it is still below the average for females now now the next point is what has been the trend because upsc asks questions related to trend what has been the trend with regards to the whole of labor force participation rate and the answer to that question is between 2000 to 2019 there was a proper decline there was a declining trend with regards to male labor force participation also going down and female labor force participation also going down and female reaching to the point of 24 percent reaching to the point of 24 percent it is only after 2019 that there has been an increase and that increase has brought the male number to 78.5 but and the female number to 37 point 37 percent in that regard so from 24 percent we have increased to 37 percent now what is this increase see increase can happen as per any form of any form of data seeing females becoming more and more part of the labor force but what is the nature of this increase so what we've established till this point is the fact that what is labor force participation rate which is labor force divided by working population working population which gives us the percentage of people as part of the labor force we can divide it into two parts which is male and female according to the data as per genders and therefore when we look at the gender rates we see that there is male 78.5 percent female 37 percent and over and above that we have come to the first conclusion which is important for your examination labor force participation men outnumber women which is in mostly in economic indicators and second we are below the world average also now on the other hand this has only reached after this is the increase between 2019 and 2023 so what has happened in these four years which has led to this increase and more than that this 200 with this data was decreasing between these 19 years it has increased only in the past three years what would explain that that would explain or explained by COVID-19. COVID-19 will have both a uh, decreasing impact but there will be a spike after COVID-19 will end and in that spike there has been increased from 24 percent to 37 percent. This is what we've established till this point. Now what was the premise for the question was what is the nature of increase? This is a very important question. What is the nature of this increase? Now when we talk about the nature of increase, nature of increase then we get the real answer that is this an encouraging figure is this a good figure or is this should we see it as a form of something where women have actually increased from 24 percent to 37 percent there's an increase of 12 percent the answer to that question is no why and this is the first thing 
which again you need to note as a part of your mains level understanding that this increase between since 2019 onwards is all based on the two thirds of the increase meaning close to 75 percent of it is actually in women self-employed category self-employed category and within the self-employed category they fall under one more important subdivision which is the concept of unpaid family labor now this unpaid family labor can be in agriculture can be in manufacturing which is household manufacturing and can be the household itself so though the women are participating more than at 37 percent from 24 percent this this 13 percent jump which you see out of this 13 percent jump 75 percent is actually not in productive sectors are not in labor intensive sectors are not in paid sector it is in unpaid family labor which is basically the informal sector which is in the in formal sector so one thing becomes very very clear that the nature of this increase is also not good is actually also not good because the employment has increased in the wrong sector itself it should have been paid it should have been labor intensive fact manufacturing or agriculture now it is self-employed as a category meaning they are employing themselves and it is going into unpaid family labor. so this is the core issue which this article actually points out that the core issue is core issue is that the unpaid family labor sector has increased and two thirds of increases this with regards to that. Now, when we talk about this article, when we talk about this article, this is the first part of the article where till this point it is trying to establish what is the problem? What is the problem? And this is based on the India Employment Report. India Employment Report of 2024 which has been launched or which is released by the institute for human development along with the ILO along with the ILO this is a very straightforward prelims level prelims level concept who releases this data and on the other hand what is the report so the report was basically the premise and over and above that, we got this data out of it, wherein, wherein we are seeing that labor force participation rate with regards to women is much lower than men and is lower than global average. And there is an increase since 2019. Now we try to establish what is the nature of this increase. The nature of this increase is actually self-employed category, unpaid family labor. Now, we have established the core issue. The core issue is that the woman is not able to come out of the household and if she is coming out of the household she is not going into progressive sectors so there are two issues one issue is with regards to what we call as institutional which is the demand side problem and the other issue is with regards to how women get access to work itself so from this point forward the discussion goes out of the economics area and goes into the social issues area now let's try to understand why is the labor force participation labor force participation rate low and how can we explain it now this should not come as a shock to us generally when it comes to women when it comes to work we already have a lot of impediments we have a lot of obstacles created for them so first and foremost is patriarchy itself or what we call as patriarchal mindset which is domination of women by men a standard protocol which has been there within what we call as agrarian societies so in the later Vedic period itself we have patriarchy taking its proper social exclusionary form for women and what we call as economic and social exclusion for women when we talk about patriarchy generally this is the first roadblock which the woman has to fight 
which is to firstly come out of the household itself. How can she come out of the household? Because then she has to either fight with the system, with the society, with the husband, with the father, with the guardian, that she should get that much level of economic freedom that she can come out of the patriarchal household. In certain cases, we believe that patriarchy has diluted itself, but it has changed its form and it exists in some form or the other for sure, which is that yes, women have more access to the economic sphere, but not at the level which it should be. And we cannot say that that patriarchy is gone. That would be a very big myth which we would create or we would basically put ourselves in a comfort zone to say that patriarchal mindsets in 2024 are over. That is not true. It has changed its form. Every woman faces it in a different form itself. As a UPSC aspirant, you would see different types of pressures on women and the male candidate. Male candidates will get more chances. For example, a female candidate will always be given an ultimatum. That is patriarchy for you, straightforward. That you can give six chances as a man, but you cannot only be give two chances or three chances. Do it after marriage, this type of attitude which exists within our society and therefore every female candidate is under pressure more and there are no it is not that there are no pressures on the male candidate but there is a added pressure which is on the female candidate where she gets a certain type of ultimatum through the patriarchal mindset which we work which we work with or exist in there's a form of indoctrination which is there that is how patriarchy actually works but the fact is patriarchy is the first thing which she has to fight as i told you now the tone of the discussion changes from economic to social issues so Patriarchy, household is the first issue which she has. Now, if she comes out of this, which is that is she is able to transcend this issue, which is that the household has been broken, she has got permission somehow. Then comes the second issue, which is labor demand, which is labor demand. And it is in which sector, which is in which sector. There has generally been a trend, there has generally been a trend where where labor intensive sectors are becoming more and more labor productive and labor intensive sectors the demand has been falling has been falling in that regard so therefore where she can work she does not get space now with labor intensive sectors going down there is also a problem that the household has changed its form also that for example even if she breaks from the household, she breaks from the patriarchal mindset. The third issue is that she is going to get most of her jobs in what are called as care giving jobs or sectors. So she will either become a part of the informal sector, she will become the part of what we call as the what we call domestic servants market, or she will become part of the labor market but only as basic labor for what we call as weight-based transportation. She will basically go into caregiving or she will be caught up in that household itself. It is here that the majority of, majority of the unpaid jobs are here, where, where her caregiving is taken as a job, but it is quite highly unpaid. And if she is able to somehow come out of the patriarchal mindset, is able to undercut the labor demand intensely she gets a demand also she is able to find a job also then education itself is a problem because the women get very very limited access to education though we have very good what we call as participation of girl child in what we call as primary or secondary and higher education we don't have women and that is also true for for example the is uh, or what we call as the upsc itself that when it comes to the percentage of women within the UPSC clearing this examination or generally bureaucrats and percentage of women, the same read is month. And therefore education becomes a certain impediment and a lot of women come out of the labor force to, be, to get education, but their entry is blocked thereafter because of the labor market changing itself. And last but not the least, last but not the least, is the biggest issue which we face today. And I should not say the least, but the biggest and the most problematic which is safety, which is safety. To be very, very honest, we do not have a workforce which is safe for women. We do not have a, a transportation system which is safe for women. As a, as a society, we failed women when it comes to creating a certain environment in which she can work and walk and operate herself in the society vis-a-vis -vis not thinking about her own safety. 
women can, are not given access to go to far away jobs with jobs actually coming uh, in different cities different sectors because of the distance because of the travel in that regard and she does not basically have access to it or or very simply if she has access to it she is not getting it because she doesn't feel safe going there so to be very clear if you look at these these are all institutional problems these are systemic problems which the women are facing first is the patriarchy which is basically societal nature when we talk about labor demand which is the systemic aspect of how employment is coming over and above that caregiving is the only sector in which she is getting any form of employment and if not if all of this is working out for her then she has to leave the job somehow as a form of a certain what we call as safety issue so it is not that women don't leave the jobs for what we call as the larger uh, what we call life cycle of a woman there is also there there's a whole work of a nobel laureate about that how the women how women interact with the labor force but that may be true for the global level and for the european model too much or more eurocentric in that nature but for us these are more systemic issues in india so as i told you the question remains is how do we move forward how do we move forward so before i talk about the way forward and let's revise what we've done till this point the first thing which we discussed was what is labor force participation rate what we discussed was labor force participation rate labor force divided by working population gives you the percentage of people as part of the labor force this can be 15 or 16 based on the data you're looking at further further we were then moving towards the women then we saw the real data which is the concept of male and female 78.5% participation of male 37% of females itself out of the 100% population of females in the working population bracket itself first conclusion we came to men are more participating than women obviously and we are below the average itself since 2000 to 2019 there was a declining trend in labor force participation for women specifically reaching till 24% but since covid 19 there is also feminization of agriculture which is also a larger systemic project not directly related to this concept but with men becoming part of what is called as seasonal listen to the words seasonal circular male migration which is that they only go in the on season in off season they are in agriculture therefore this is called the permanent state of structural transformation as we call it which is that men go to the urban sector at a certain point thereafter they work get the money and they come back so it is seasonal single male only the male uh, member goes circular circular because it it is going out of agriculture into industry then back to agriculture and this migration is non permanent and that is why the industrial revolution as we call it did not happen in india because of the structural transformation issue structural transformation is movement out of which is absolute movement not relative absolute movement of labor and population out of the agriculture sector into the secondary sector that never happened in india and therefore this this process of single male migration is basically called the concept of uh, has has a tangential impact which is called the concept of feminization of agriculture because for a, a certain part of the season or for the certain part of the agriculture cycle women are the only one who are attending to agriculture so that labor is also in a way form of disguise and employment because they are not needed in that sector but they are still there so as i told you with with women there is a problem that mostly the agricultural sector and our labor market is skewed in itself and therefore therefore this is the data which proves that too now should we be we should we be happy with this increase from 24% to 37% the answer to that was no because the nature of increase is not correct it is in unpaid family labor jobs in self employment category and what are the obstacles we have patriarchy labor demand we have caregiving as an issue further for over that the safety issue which is a perpetual issue it's a psychological issue it is a disease in our society where we have to create a conducive environment for women to feel safe that we don't do and therefore how do we undercut this the answer is very simple firstly there needs to be a behavioral change behavioral change when it comes to safety and patriarchy women should not have the same should not have other pressures than what already exist in the labor force first second we need to invest in labor intensive sectors where women can get jobs and they are not getting jobs as of right now and last but not the least is we need to make sure that 
women can be taken out of the informal sector through certain schemes and put into the formal sector. Formal, informal, major difference, safety net. Which is if there is no form of say, social security, there's no form of leave, there's no form of uh, what we call as maternity leave, there's no form of EPFO, there's no point for, form of provident fund, then it is an informal sector, can, contractual jobs as they call them. If you are a contractual job, uh, contractual job based person, you are in the informal sector. When you are, a, for example, a payroll employee, then you are basically a, you are a formal sector. In India as it is, there is a skew between formal and informal. 96% of all labor force somehow is in the informal sector. That is the informalization of what we call as a working class as of right now, which is happening in every sector from teaching to what we call as the corporate jobs also. There is a certain movement towards contractual jobs. So this is the main gist of this article. I have given enough time to basically explain to you the basic contours which come out of it. A very simple straightforward prelims question which you can see on our telegram channel also which is basically on telegram channel after every session five questions are uploaded you can join the telegram channel upsc uh, unacademy is english and you will get the questions five questions within one and a half hours this is a prelims question standard over and above that we've understood the mains level understanding this is because i want you to understand this and able to write there's a mains question in the end for this so hang around for that also now with this let's move to the second article the second article deals with a very important sector which the government of India has been actually pushing in a lot of money into which is solar, which is basically solar. Solar sector, we are a very important part of the solar alliance itself. Solar power, India has a very big potential. But this article is not related to the potentialities of solar power, but related to the economics of social power. Wherein, wherein there is a certain uh, rule which has come into effect as of 1st April and that rule is called which was developed by the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. The rule is called the approved modules and manufacturers of solar photovoltaic modules requirement for compulsory registration order 2019. It's a 2019 based order which basically deals with approved models and manufacturers of solar PVs which is full of photovoltaic cells. Now, this rule is a very interesting one. It's a voluntary rule. But let's try to understand why would people want to go it? Why would and manufacturers want to go into it? Now, let's first try to understand how does a solar market in India work? When we talk about the solar market in India, there are two. See, one thing is you need to make a solar cell. When you need to make a solar cell, solar cell needs what is called as ignots ingots and wafers. Now, India is generally deficient in what is called as ingots and wafers manufacturing because you need rare earth metals for this and we are not very good with what are called PN junction semiconductors. Semiconductor manufacturing in India is a problem because of lack of resources. So, ignots and wafers, this is the first issue which we can see. Now, when it comes to solar cell, solar cell, 95 to 98% of all solar cells in India are imported. Are imported either from China or from South Korea or from any other country which has, or basically these are the two biggest countries with semiconductor manufacturing. Solar cell, there is no chance India can actually, as of right now, be a threat to either of these two countries when it comes to manufacturing. However, however, now, once you get a solar cell, we need big modules. One cell, you need to make big, big modules and panels. You've seen, if you've seen a solar panel, it would be a very big panel, like a very big board, like this board itself. It would be a very big module in that regard. Now, when it comes to solar cells and solar panels, there are two types of manufacturers in India. One, which basically assemble and import solar panels in that regard. So therefore, they are actually not doing anything. They are solar cell manufacturing is already happening in China. They will import the panel, change the tag and put in an Indian name, which is that this is an Indian manufactured. This is what we, according to them, this is what is called as 
मेक इन इंडिया दिस इज देयर फेक मेक इन इंडिया विच इज दैट दैट वी आर बेसिकली असेंबलिंग एंड इंपोर्टिंग सोलर पैनल दिस इज अकॉर्डिंग टू द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया not considered as a form of manufacturing when it comes to solar panels the other one are who basically import solar cells and thereafter what they do is they manufacture and produce produce solar panels you solar panels this according to the government of india is the definition of a manufacturer of solar panels which will be considered indigenous when the solar cell is imported but the panel is created in india itself basically they are getting the raw material and they are creating the panel itself in india this lot is not considered indigenous this lot is considered indigenous now the rules the new rule the 2019 rule which has come into effect says very simply a manufacturer can ask the ministry of new and renewable energies to send an inspection team that inspection team would basically go from the national institute of solar energy and going from the national institute of solar energy they would accredit this process they would accredit this process that if there is a manufacturer if there is a manufacturer who basically makes solar panel who makes what we call as solar panels he can contact the ministry of new and renewable energies new and renewable energies that we would want you to inspect our factory and through this inspection through this inspection what would happen is that the government of india the ministry of new and renewable energies would send the national representative from the national institute of solar energy to go and inspect this if it inspects the factory and it says we approve we approve that yes this manufacturer is a solar panel manufacturer under what we call as solar manufacturing this approved status is extremely important now onwards why because see this is a voluntary act not everybody or not every manufacturer has to do this it is on the onus is on the manufacturer to contact the ministry of new and renewable energy and get this approved status now the question is why would then somebody go through this whole hassle of getting it inspected asking the national institute of solar energy people coming there after getting this approved status this is very very important because now with this new rule which is coming in the amendment which is important for registration you can exist as a solar man panel manufacturer or assembler however when it will come to flagship schemes when it will come to government tender for solar power and when it will come to the pli scheme which is production link linked insect intensive uh, incentive scheme which is that basically you can get incentives subsidies or cashbacks on certain production outputs when you meet a certain output you get the incentive so when we talk about the pli when we talk about the flagship schemes when we talk about the government tender for solar power now from any person any project any manufacturer who comes into existence after march of 2024 which is since last month it does not apply on anybody before march of 2024 any new manufacturer if he does not have an approved status if you do not have approved status you cannot apply for either you cannot apply for either only an approved manufacturer under this scheme will have the right to apply to any of these three which is pli production link incentive or any flagship scheme 
कुसुम फॉर एग्जाम्पल पी एम कुसुम और एनी फॉर्म ऑफ गवर्नमेंट टेंडर एनी वेयर वेयर देर इज अ गवर्नमेंट टेंडर गवर्नमेंट सब्सिडी इन्वॉल्व फॉर्म ऑफ एनी फॉर्म ऑफ इंसेंटिव दिस अप्रूव स्टेटस इज गोइंग टू बी एक्सट्रीमली नेसेसरी एक्सट्रीमली इंपॉर्टेंट एंड एक्सट्रीमली क्रिटिकल विच इज अन विच इज नॉट गोइंग टू बी गिवन टू अ नॉन अप्रूव्ड मैन्युफैक्चर दिस इज द पॉइंट दैट यू आर बेसिकली इंसेंटिवाइजिंग इंस्पेक्शन इंसेंटिवाइजिंग इंसेंटिवाइजिंग not importing the panel but importing the solar cell and then manufacturing the panel and in a way truly incentivizing make in india to the level we can do it in that sense now the three things which we have established till this point is that you have imported panels assembled assembled in not assembled in india just bringing everything here and making the big panels here bringing the solar cell then making the panels thereafter thereafter a certain process which has been introduced applied from 1st april 2024 the question was why would they do it because if you want any tender with the government you need the approved status the last but not the least concept is can or why is india doing this therein comes the geopolitical angle therein comes the geopolitical angle 80% of all the manif- all the solar panels in the world are right now chinese however eu the us have moved away from Chinese panels. So there's a very big gap which has been created, which India can actually use, and therefore, therefore, it is important that we understand that government-tendered solar panels, be it flagship schemes or be it PLI, this may be the push which we need, which is that we reduce our dependence on the importing of solar panels, but import solar cells, and at least reduce the cost by doing that. So the article, in that sense, has very beautifully pointed out. that how can the new approved models and manufacturing of solar photovoltaic module order change everything and it can change everything because now with this approved status under this amendment there's a chance that people will be more inclined to not go for properly everything being done in china and bringing it to india rather only getting the solar cells and then developing everything in india semiconductor manufacturing is a totally different concept itself because semiconductor manufacturing needs a lot of fresh water water is already a very scarce resource in india needs a lot of invest- investment is a very very capital intensive sector and the turnaround time is close to 5 to 10 years to get even the first billion or second billion what we call as investment to come back therefore semiconductor manufacturing is a separate issue altogether but solar panels in that regard can be the future when we comes to when it comes to solar cells coming in and we can reduce the cost by basically and reducing the dependence on china is equally important so i hope that this article is also clear in your mind two we've discussed one related to women labor work labor force participation rate second one related to the concept of solar cells then after we can move to another topic which gets aligned with the concept of science and technology which is the h5n1 virus Now H five N one is nothing new. H five N one is nothing new. We call it the avian influenza, sometimes also called in standard terms bird flu. But we are moving towards a certain certain zone now that we would have to abandon this concept of calling it bird flu itself or avian influenza. and that is why this article is very very important see we generally used to believe that the h5n1 used to spread used to spread from bird to bird which is that it was an avian variety of virus which is to spread from bird to bird and it emerged in europe unlike most of the diseases it emerged in europe and spread to asia and africa to the poultry sector and the most impacted in this is the poultry sector as of right now because of the chicken demand in in the world the chicken supply gets affected because we used to think that h5n1 used to impact only birds very rarely very rarely we saw any tangential impact on humans directly from birds eating of it which is that consum- consuming the virus through infected bird is something which will directly give it to you 
but it was like from what we call as COVID-19, like airborne transmission from bird to human was extremely rare, extremely rare, but possible. Now, why are we saying that we need to abandon the concept of calling it H5N1, or rather calling it H5N1 and removing the bird flu concept itself? It's very simply because now, now, in America, which is the point of this article, cattle, cows have got infected, have got infected by, by the H5N1, what we call as variety of variety of viruses in russia in russia we have seen seals in antarctica we have seen polar bears also getting h5n1 and further further it is going into marine animals and there's a very good chance that it could go into mammals also, which is already it is entering. Sea lions and everything we getting infected. Now, this is a problem. Specifically, poultry sector was affected. Now the meat industry can get affected. But more than that, this is spreading like an epidemic and then like a pandemic amongst the different species of animals itself. We thought that this was an avian variety of flu. It is not an avian variety of flu. It is now spreading across species itself. And in America, there has also been one case under which the, the cattle has infected human. Though the person has recovered very mild symptoms with redness of eye and basic fever. And in cattle, it leads to again redness of eye, basic fever, along with that, uh, the lactation period and the, the what we call as milk output reduces. But in America, it is spreading like a problem within cattle. At least five different states in America as of right now are reeling under cattle-based H5N1 variety. Now, why does this become relevant for your preparation? Because in the prelims examination, and if you've actually done the weekly, what we call as quiz, the one which was, which was released on this Thursday by me, I had a question on this, which is H5N1. Because the Indian Express had an article before the Hindu on this itself that can we now say that H5N1 is only an avian variety or bird to bird transmission? The answer is no, because it is going into, in, into mammals, it is going into cattle, it is going into marine animals and therefore this concept of avian variety is gone. Avian variety is gone. This is where, this is where there's a lot of fear which is developing within the whole what we call as meat sector, the poultry sector and animal husbandry. because. As of right now, at least six different states, five properly, six uh, tangentially is getting impacted in America. It is not that uh, Peru, Chile, Russia, Antarctica, uh, in India, the avian variety itself is a major issue. So H5N1 now needs to be taken with a little bit of seriousness because of this transmigration which is happening within, within the species itself. We have to make sure that we can actually find a solution for this vaccination of each and every animal is obviously not possible that is that is basically not not tenable but we have not taken h5n1 very seriously and from time to time it is coming to humans the viral load and maybe the impact may increase and in between all of this we are stuck we already know what covid19 could do we already know what a bat based virus could do now, if H5N1 can impact humans and animals together, it could be a disaster in waiting and making. And therefore, when it comes to the CDC, when it comes to the uh, Indian uh, institutions related to viral, uh, viral diseases, virology, we need to make sure that they develop a certain model or a certain plan to do what, what, we, what they need to do with regards to this. Because this may be a disaster in making. So what do you remember from this? is very simply the straightforward concept which is that which is that one second okay uh, which is that you have to make sure that prelims examination you should understand that h5n1 they can straight away ask you avian influenza but very soon we will get a reconfiguration and a renaming of this for sure 
because of the fact that it it is now impacting everyone but most important most important you please remember in the examination if it says only birds then the answer to this question is incorrect it is not only birds it is it is now mammals it is now marine animals it is impacting everyone so please make sure when only bird statement is coming mark it incorrect mark it incorrect so with this let's move to a very interesting article on the front page of the hindu newspaper itself delhi edition which is related to a scheme which is called the green credit scheme the green credit program what is called as BCP. Now, to understand this, you need to understand a larger concept. See, as of right now, as of right now, for example, I'm a mine company, meaning that I do mining, I'm a coal mine company. As of right now, if a coal mine company finds to survey a mine in, for example, a track of land, which has, which is a forested area, which is a forested area. It is a forested, forested area. Now the problem is because it is a forested area, it would need to take permissions for the, the Ministry of Environment and the Forest Department of the sector to mine here. Now coal as a resource is important. So the perm permission firstly should not be given, but because it is a necessity, energy security is important. This track of land A may be diverted towards mining. So this would go for what we call as form of deforestation. Deforestation of the sector and the trees will be cut. Now, there is deforestation of the sector. Trees have been cut. So under what is called as CAMPA, under CAMPA, it is called compensatory compensatory afforestation fund management and management authority under CAMPA what would happen is it is a act which argues that if you divert land, forested land, out of forest into non-forested use, a non-forestry use, you have to do two things. You do two things. You have two options. Either, either you first, first, either you do afforestation which is a form that a degraded forest, a degraded forest or for example, a barren land can be afforested. That you do, if you are cutting 1 lakh trees, you plant 2 lakh trees. Why not? And if this is not possible, the net present value, which is decided by the forest department with regards to how much is the present value as per environmental impact and social impact, and therefore an economic cost is created, you pay double compensation for this deforestation to the CAMPA authority, to the CAMPA authority. Compensatory afforestation fund management, you have to, you have to send money to this authority. Now, as of right now, neither of the two is happening because a forestation for degraded land, there was a dearth of information where air forestation can happen, ideally very close to forest itself. And a lot of money was being sent to the fund management and planning authority. To the fund management and planning authority, they were sending a lot of money. The compensatory afforestation fund management and planning authority was getting a lot of money, crores of rupee as of right now, are locked into the CAMPA fund with no use itself because they don't know where to A forest, 
they don't know what to do with this money because this money can be divert cannot be diverted to other places it can only be used for afforestation now we are cutting the forests forests are not being afforested and more than that this fund is lying down now what the government is trying to do is trying to undercut this which is a mine company putting a land into non forestry use not doing afforestation sending the compensation to the campa campa authority itself however there is no tangible change in the forest cover in india so in order to undercut this comes gcp which is the concept of green green credit program and this is a very interesting concept the green credit program is a very interesting concept why because under this green credit program what can be done is that is that now what it has asked is 10 states have identified have identified forests which are in a degraded position or areas which can be afforested and and now the companies can can a mining company a mining company under gcp can finance or fund the afforestation of this area can fund the afforestation of this area the afforestation itself will be done by the forest department will be done by the forest department and after two years of afforestation when the sapling will at least become a small tree for every tree you get one credit for every tree you get one credit and you can compensate this credit in your campa obligation for example i got i was able to plant one lakh trees so i can now adjust these one lakh trees as one lakh credit and this one lakh credit can be adjusted not as one lakh rupees but even in net present value vis-a-vis -vis that one lakh tree the degraded forest what is the value can be compensated in campa so basically this is a master stroke and what has been identified is that mp and chhattisgarh have identified 879 hectares and 663 hectares of forests which are degraded forests which can be afforested so mp chhattisgarh assam telangana bihar rajasthan gujarat maharashtra odisha and daman and view have sent in data that we have we have this much land from 25 hectares to 879 hectares of forests which are degraded forests and can be taken up for forestation if you will forest this you will get green credit green credit can then be adjusted in campa this is where it is a master stroke that basically the campa fund campa fund is not getting used not used now when this is not getting used what they are doing is that this credit system can therefore Firstly, undercut the need for a fund itself, and second, incentivize, incentivize, or what we can say is it can create a system, it can create a system under which under which afforestation is funded by the private bodies, and they are getting in a way compensated by the campa. So they had to pay campa rather get the credits and in a way adjust it this also will encourage csr which is corporate social responsibility based what we call as green credits green, these green credits could become basically a parallel economy itself they could become a parallel economy which could in a way act as a new way of foresting the companies have to pay money they could finance the state state forest departments or the forest department to a forest they will a forest 
the companies will look forward to the credits they will take care of that forest itself and that credit could be shown through a certificate to the government that see we have a forested and because the state state is identifying the areas which are degraded this is in itself a win-win situation if we can forest even half of this land which has been actually actually uh, designated as a pro a forestation area within the states it would be a major win for this system but major win for our econ economy and our environment itself therefore a very very interesting solution this can come as a question straight forward green credit program what is the mechanism of it what is the concept of it so you have to make sure that you remember this now before we go to the smaller topics what have we done till this point we have understood first women and their labor force participation rate and why it is low what is the issue second we have also understood the concept of h5n1 h5n1 and how it will be it is moving out of avian varieties and becoming more and more problematic we have also established the green credit program which is the concept of how this credit program could be the new future for compensatory afforestation and we also discussed this solar scheme and the changes which are happening in the solar scheme it is the sunday day so sunday newspaper so there's no editorial but these were four very interesting articles for your preparation generally after this after this we have two very important developments first you should remember nemu then after we have the padam nemu padam karcha karcha road this is a road which connects himachal pradesh with leh now generally when it comes to this route it is a very difficult route to go through and the advantage to this route between himachal pradesh and leh is it does not have on any of its side either pakistan or china in that sense it's a very safe route and the government of india has been planning in what is called as the zanskar valley a ordinance factory ordinance factory is basically arms and ammunition factory which could be a game changer for our military infrastructure in this sector however this route needs to made better the problem is that there is one pass in this sector that pass is called the the shinkula pass the shinkula pass and the shinkula pass is considered one of the highest passes in the world the height wise highest pass in the world now what the bro has actually done is that it has got a breakthrough in this sector with construction happening between himachal pradesh and leh at a very good rate by 2025 we will have this road itself and we are also developing the world's highest tunnel in the in the shinkula pass or the shinkula tunnel itself by 2025 this sector may be a very safe and fast route between himachal pradesh and leh therefore any route as of right now is open to forms of hostility from both our problematic neighbors but this could be a game changer so please remember shinkula pass zanskar nemu padam darcha road is can come in the prelims examination straight forward and this is a news which will keep on developing and is important for your preparation generally thereafter thereafter with elections in two places together the us and india happening this year itself with the us one going to spill over into the next year also china has now become a little bit problematic in the sense china is using and this is again cyber security china is using ai generated content images videos which are misleading people with regards to their governments their leaders and recently microsoft and its intelligence group has found that in myanmar a lot of the content generated by the chinese ai is basically discrediting india and the us saying that myanmar was destabilized by india and the us together now this is the problem with what we call as ai and the what we call as old institution this is a very interesting intersection where an election which is a very democratically very important institution gets intersected by these new form of technologies and how people's opinion can be changed or impacted through these type of concept itself so i hope 
that this is something which can again bec become developed into a certain main question when how ai is also a threat to democracy via china and ai generated content but we will wait for more and more information coming to it this has come from microsoft with regards to flagging off as the two biggest democracies one of one the oldest one the biggest india and and america going in elections may see chinese north korean and russian intervention when it comes to cyber security so with this what what we can do is we can look at the main questions and we can end the session but before we can we do that remember the, the on the telegram channel you will get questions out of this whole discussion over and above that you should also know that today we have the ucsc at 5 pm if you're not at 11 the first uh, slot or the first sector would have started at 5 pm you have another opportunity we also have aram at 1 pm do become part of it aram 2024 the biggest event with regards to our our channel our institution itself for it je and and neat and now now last but not the least remember there's a pro there's a certain scheme going on 50 percent of plus six months six months extension with this let's look at the main question women's participation in the workforce has been either declining or increasing in unpaid sectors discuss the above statement with reference to the impediments in their participation in workforce 151 you can write the answer to this question in the chat box and we would be happy to assess it and we will give you a comment there itself thereafter what is the green credit program how can it be a game changer in compensatory afforestation 251 you can feel free to write any of these answers comment them in the chat box and we will be happy to assess it also so thank you and i will see you again from another perspective maybe from our past or from the hindu analysis remember we have the ucsc today do give it at 5 pm and and take care thank you if you like these sessions if you find them useful do like share share and subscribe to the channel thank you take care bye bye